Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rainiac, welcome to Doctor Who Reviews, and today we're going to be reviewing Thin Ice, written by Sarah Dollard. And joining me to talk about Thin Ice, firstly, to my virtual left, she's cold as ice, she's willing to sacrifice, but we won't talk about who or what she's willing to sacrifice, because that would be too long an answer, it's Cat. Seriously? And to my virtual right, he's been gone so long, he fits right in with the rest of the forgotten continuity of this damn show, it's Kachiri. <laughs> okay, when did we get the Joker uh, on? <laughs> My mistake is not a cherry, it's a hyena. <laughs> a hyena has broken into the studio that we don't use. <laughs> and we have one big ass studio, it like covers the entire ocean. The desk <laughs> is that long, and all the recording tr equipment. We have to buy, if, like, I, if I reach out <clears throat> with a 10,000 mile foot pole, I can almost touch Rainiac. <laughs> Doctor Who reviews is found in front of a live studio audience. Uh, <laughs> 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 and 10 seconds in, we already derailed the podcast, guys. All right. That's a record. Good well job, Kachiri. <laughs> More like 30 seconds. So, yeah, Thin Ice. Sarah Dollard's second it. script for this, um, for, for Doctor Who. And pretty darn good, I think you'll agree. Oh yeah, no, and it, it's I, I've uh, mentioned to you guys before. This is honestly the first script in quite a long while that actually explains everything very well before the climax. Like there wasn't a lot of just plot holes or deus exes. So yeah. <clears throat> when you say deus exes, you mean mankind divided or? I mean, Machinos, you know, the doctor. Just I know you do, but I was making a video game joke. The doctor reaches into the TARDIS, sets up his asshole, and pulls out the way to win the uh, the day. Same yes. Day. Yes, Same I did the like trailer. the resolution to the episode. I, I thought it was it was a more <sighs> logical. Can I even say logical with this show? Not really. That makes really. sense. Yes, it, it 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 made more sense than than some of the uh, resolutions we've had in uh, in recent uh, in recent times. It made more sense of a fucking leaf. <laughs> we don't talk about the leaf. <laughs> it's funny because like the previous one at first was like raving about that that leaf. We don't talk about the leaf. <laughs> um, you know, you know, it makes more sense than you know. There's actually no danger. The Earth is just protecting itself. Uh. And we especially don't talk about that, right? So, <laughs> yeah, we don't. Let's now got, move on. Now, now we've got the housekeeping and general silliness out of the way. Uh, we're going to start by discussing not the Doctor, but Bill. Bill had quite a bit of significant character development in this one, and I think for the most part, it was pretty good. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh yeah, I. You haven't been around the last few episodes, but I hated Bill. Like, her introduction, her first episode. Wow, gee, what a surprise. You Can't you just hear the mouth. sheer surprise in my voice? Be nice, Cat. Be nice. He's not been here for two weeks. I'm but so like surprised. It's, this, the last episode, Smile, I did enjoy her... Some of her scenes better. I mean, it wasn't until this episode when you can start seeing that she's starting to fully understand what the doctor's all about. This is not just a field trip. Yeah. The whole thing with realizing mm. that he's seen and experienced and caused death before, uh, re you know, seeing how old he was. Just oh, the, everything that she sort of realizes about the doctor. That um, this is not a man. This is not a human. This is an alien from a different species with, you know... Mostly different ideas of how things should go. Mostly different concepts of uh, morality. But he still somehow makes you think that he is a human. And she felt so safe in that that it took her until now to realize he's not a human. He's an alien. What am I doing? Yeah, uh, she had the, the greatest, like one of the greatest lines probably in a Doctor Who in such a while. Uh, how long do you have to live to say a speech like that? Like, that was such a good line. Yeah, that was a great line. That was beautiful. If we're talking about great lines, Bill had quite a few of them in this episode, or, or just exchanges of dialogue. 
Uh, for a completely different reason, my favourite one was when they're talking to that stupid foreman. <laughs> it was a great bit of comic relief, it must be said. That whole scene oh, yeah. was great. It's oh, like, we must be up the backside of the uh, creature now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she just sort of slowly puts the brick down. We're at the tail end of it now. Uh, but no, it's, when they're talking to the foreman, he's, he's, he's like, um, keep asking questions like that, and you won't be working here much longer. I guarantee it. <laughs> That was a great scene, but it, it led to the perhaps the funniest line of the whole episode. It says, uh, anything else you can tell me about this fuel? Well, they say it even burns underwater. And then Bill just goes, no shit. And then it cuts to a horse when he had a different scene. <laughs> I thought it said, oh that. shit. I just, it's, it no, it's, no, no? it's no shit. <laughs> she goes, no shit. <laughs> and it cuts to a different scene. <laughs> that was great. That was the best. The writing of this in general was pretty darn good, it must be said. Oh, yeah. Although, um, <clears throat> just to get this out of the way, Tumblr was kind of divisive on this. I thought it would be. So, um, yeah, we'll just sort of glance over that and say, you know, it, it didn't trigger some people, but it enticed the wrong people to start talking. If we're talking about Tumblr, it didn't trigger people. If we're talking about Twitter, it triggered a couple of people, but we'll get to that in due course. Yeah. Because, oh my god, that's both hilarious and very disappointing. Uh, my, uh, another really good scene is when, uh, Bill actually spots someone die for the first time. Although she wasn't paying attention last week, was she? <laughs> when two of the colonists were grounded to fertilizer before her very eyes. Mm. I guess she wasn't paying attention during that whole firefight. Or it could just be shock. Yeah, shock it could is be like shock. a hell of a drug. And also, she didn't really relate to those colonists, but she related to the little boy because, well, he was a little boy, and they just interacted with him about 30 seconds previous. All right, so I'm probably not even that. Maybe during the scene where all those little robots were flying around and the colonists were shooting them, she probably just turned away and looked away like while the fire was going on. I mean... She didn't hear you know, the death screams? That's a bit... Well, they were all screaming. Oh, true. It could, it I mean, could be that, plus the fact that not only is she seeing this little boy get sucked down into the ice, but the doctor makes a grab for him, but it turns out he's just grabbing the Sonic. Oh, him caressing the Sonic screwdriver. Oh, That was heartbreaking. That like, was a little knew, bit callous. I knew oh, that there was nothing dead. he could do, the but was still. Dead. Yeah, I mean, the, the kid was already dead. He couldn't save him. Also... I Kuchiri doesn't know this, but remember how last week I said, oh, wow, amazing, someone got dragged under the ice. That's how they died. Guess what they fucking got ha happened? <laughs> they got dragged under the fucking ice and died. <laughs> I wonder what the mystery is there, guys. Gee, it's like the episode was called Thin Ice for a reason. Well, wasn't the, even that thin. No, it wasn't. And the thing is, the ice just re-solidified itself. Yeah, I think, actually, I would take this to be a more of a metaphor uh, I can't even say it, metaphorical title. And the thin ice is actually the uh, the line that the Doctor is skating on with his morality. And dealing with Bill. And dealing <laughs> with Bill. That's just my take on it. I could be completely wrong. I probably am completely wrong, but that's just my take if on Bill it. If Bill was as bad as she was during the first episode of the trailer, the thin ice would be, when will the Doctor just backslap her? Just, <laughs> shut up! <laughs> <laughs> it's not Malcolm Tucker, dude. <laughs> but no, Bill had... Bill had a lot of character development in this. It was really good, I thought. Yeah. Especially with her speech. Well, not really speech, but her questioning the doctor as mm. to how many people he lost count of who died. Oh, God. Him, and how many people he killed. Yeah. And it, it said, don't tell me, it's you like, lost count. I, I was about ready to start crying myself. But then again, I was tipsy, so... I, I like that the doctor didn't have a conventional answer for her because that's not a convention. That's not a, that's not a question you can answer conventionally. No, Plus, him either. trying to avoid it, where he was like, "There's some circumstance." She's like, "No." Yeah, she a she, yes she or no question. She chances him on it, and I like that. But the thing is, the real answer, though, if he actually said the real answer, will make him sound even worse than him not answering. Like, I witnessed millions of people dying. So you ignoring this one small child means he's nothing. Well, I mean, plus, I mean, depending on continuity, which, as we know, is a crapshoot in Doctor Who, it could be anywhere between millions to billions to 
who the fuck even knows anymore? If your yeah, orchestra yeah, reminds Beck briefly to the 50th anniversary, yeah, you might remember that the the, the three doctors are asking, you know, how many civilians are going to die when they uh, when they do this and blow up Scar Scar and Gallifrey, and um, they're like, you've forgotten the exact number, haven't you? I, I thought so, and then he says the exact number. I don't know the exact number of hand, but um, it, it's a bit like that. But here it's the, it's the reverse. He doesn't know the exact number, or he doesn't, or he does, or but he doesn't want to say. It. Yeah, if you say out loud, I've seen billions of people die, and he's already over this one death, it makes it seem like that he just doesn't care. Which, considering the scene with the son and screwdriver, will even smash that deeper in. But the thing is, he's trying to let her know he does care, but he does not want her to know how much he, like, that number, or else he'll just shrink in that one kid's death. Yeah, because like he said, there comes a point where you've seen so much, you've done so much, you mm. can't take it all in. It's the same thing that happens when there are troops in other countries fighting, you know, for whatever reason they have to fight for. They have to learn to adapt. They have to learn to survive. Yeah. That's why people, like, there are some people who take humor in dangerous situations, and they go with dark humor. That's their way of coping with it. Absolutely. Well, it's... It's like, you know, you say, oh, I've seen five people die. Well, those five people each have a greater weight when you say, I have five, I've seen five people die. When you say, I've seen five billion people die, that equal weight is insignificant. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But no, I thought the scene where she questioned him on, you know, I've noticed that anyone died before. How many people have you seen die? Have you killed anyone ever? Was That was brilliant. That was wonderful. They let her know what he's willing to do and what he's seen to try and keep everyone alive. So the it next may have time been Bill's best scene to date, actually. If, if he says, like, stay here, which she's been ignoring him for the last two episodes, if he says stay here, she might now actually have the motivation to stay still. Yeah. <clears throat> Plus, at near the end of the episode, she saw him actually kill somebody. Well, she, you could argue... He, that he did not actually kill Lord Sutcliffe. He dies as a result no, of no, the... No, 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 not no, him. The, the, the guy in the tent. Hand. Oh, well, the guy, no, yeah. no, he doesn't kill him either. No, he, he takes the sonic he off gives, him. He lures him in with the sonic screwdriver. No, he doesn't lure him in. The guy takes the screwdriver, and instead of t the doctor saying, you know, like, throw it back to me or get rid of it, he's, like, trying to get the guy to push a button. And he, like, purposely misdirected the guy. So that he would be snatched by the fish. Yes and no, yes and no. He doesn't actually... Him being brought into the tent is not part of his plan. He's brought into the tent because the lights under the ice draw him in. And the Doctor wasn't anticipating that because he didn't know the sound waves at that time uh, activated the fish. He was just trying to get free and using the Sonic. I think but then he, he used know it to, No, 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 no. At first he didn't, but then he did know, and then he knew what he had to do once the guy came in because that guy was going to leave them in there to die. Yeah. So, the doctor was explaining earlier, there are some, thi some things you have to do in order to survive. Whenever he was first asked, how many people have you killed? Okay, and so... I think, I think this falls into, you know, giving the guy the screwdriver and then get him into the corner of the tent and have him throw the screwdriver back and turn it off was one of those unnecessary evils. If, if we... Uh, necessary evil, not unnecessary. Mm -hmm. I knew what you meant, I knew what you meant, but, um, all right, yeah, if, we, yeah. if we take that as a guy that, that uh, the Doctor killed, Devil's Advocate, he was in league with the villains. Oh, no, we're not saying it's wrong, because obviously this guy, he was he was helping with this mass murdering plot. What we're saying is that he still killed somebody in front of Bill, okay, who at yeah. this time had not known that he was capable of doing that. And Bill's face does actually show that off and, and sort of uh, support your theory. So, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm all right with that. So this this not only gives Bill a little bit of development in showing that this is what this man is capable of and this is why he will be willing to do this stuff, in this case, saving all of those people from dying in the water to a fish just so some guy can literally have fish shit out bricks of, of money. It prints money! That sentence it literally, is... it literally has money coming out the wazoo. 
that sentence, so a fish can shit out bricks of money, that, that's going to take some time to pass. I'm sorry. Take some x lax you'll shit out later. Oh my god, could Sherry really? <laughs> we'll give you some Pepto-Bismol or something. <laughs> well, you can drown someone in that, I hear. Can I bring Not up the Not sure in- how you knew that, but I kind of don't want to know. So <laughs> let's move on. What happened to Fresno, it's a by quote, the way? It's a quote from a what, review what by Fresno? Nash. Where, it, where's he at? No, I don't mean I yeah, kill him. Yeah, we're in the act. Where's Fresno? I don't mean I kill him in Pepto Bismol, you <laughs> fools. I mean, I'm quoting another reviewer <laughs> from the Happiness Patrol. I did it to introduce you in the episode last week, Cat. Come on. <laughs> I changed Pepto Bismol to emojis. And I'm now I know when I'm being trolled. You, I just realized I'm being trolled. <laughs> Are you? Are you yes, really? By you, by Jerry, by myself not realizing. <laughs> <laughs> the man who owned himself, and I'm not even. <laughs> right, moving on. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, um, elephant in the room, gonna bring it up. And I don't mean the oh, elephant no, on the right. ice. I, I don't mean, I don't mean the elephant on the ice. I mean, um, the Bill's ethnicity being used as part of the plot. I'm fine with this. Yeah. It happens with Martha during the. It happened a little movie. bit with Martha during the Shakespeare episode. The Shakespeare cut. No, no, that, it's not just Shakespeare. It was the the other one where he. Was oh, you're the, right. The, human nature. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was much more overt in in, Our, in human nature. You're right. You are so kind to your servant. Th- that whole thing about the staff entrance is horrible. Like she goes to the to this one, he goes, "Oh, staff entrance, I think." Message, yeah, tell, yeah, right, mate, or something along those lines. That's pretty horrible. This is equally horrible, but I don't mind the fact that they're using her ethnicity for the purposes of the plot. Some people on the internet objected. Gee, well, people on the internet objected to something. <coughs> well, yeah, the I can't believe that happened. Can't believe that you happened. You go to you go to an age where slavery was legal and whites were like the main fish of the sea, yes, there's going to be racism. It's going to happen. It doesn't matter. But, like, Bill even brought it up herself. She was the one yeah. who was all like, there's a lot more people of color here Bit than more black history than I says. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not just that. Even, like, at the start of the episode, she's like, are you sure we should be here? I don't have the complexion for it. Uh, yeah, melanin. melanin. Melanin, yeah, melanin. I like that she wasn't the first time she brought it up, it was a bit more subtle. And then she was less subtle. But the Regency of England was was a much less subtle time. <clears throat> Things were more, yeah. if you'll pardon the pun, black and white in those days. Then yeah, no, but the thing is like you don't like if you if he goes to like nineteen seventy nine seventeen eighties fucking America sometime with Bill, same shit's gonna happen, maybe even worse. I mean if you have an episode that way and, like, people aren't trying to lynch her, then you're not representing that age well. Yeah, it's the whole fact that Bill's going to be a lot more outspoken as a modern woman. So it's like all of the companions have had this where they kind of said something they shouldn't have or were a bit more forceful than they should have been. So... It's yeah. not something that Bill owns by herself. It's something all the companions really did. It's the old argument, point. isn't it? It's the old argument of historical accuracy versus entertainment value. Yeah. Should you strive to be 100% historically accurate, even if it may be at the expense of some of the entertainment of the of the storyline, or do you try and make the storyline as entertaining as possible at the expense of being not entirely historically accurate? See, so personally... Arguments. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, personally, I would rather have historically accurate because... Life isn't black and white anymore. Mm. There are these shades of gray, and it, there are these moments where people forget certain things. Like, people forget, and I'm sorry for bringing this up, but people forget Hitler was human. He was a vegetarian. He brought back Germany from, you know, uh, economical collapse. He liked to play around with kids on weekends or whatever he liked to do. Mm. He wore stupid shorts sometimes, just like every white person in America has done at some point. Don't apologize for bringing him up, because in this context, it's absolutely relevant. 
Yeah, you're if you forget right. that to pain. he's a human, if you forget he's, he's like a to human, pain. There's if a, you there's... think of him as just a monster, you mm. are denying history. You are denying that this there's, happened. There's and that's really... why people like a current, a certain current orange man are able to get into power using things that are traditionally racist sounding. Well, the because thing is, you forget this stuff. Going back on the whole Hitler thing, there's that creepy video of his uh, wife videotaping him, and he's like giggling with embarrassment because he's like, "Oh, I should be videotaping you." You know, it's yeah. like, yeah, you, know, you watch that video, and you're like, "Man, he was strangely, strangely gentle in this scene," and it's like. You know, you know how horrible he became. Because as monstrous as Hitler was, like it or not, he was still a human being. It's the same with abuse victims. They often don't want to see their abusers as terrible because they put on a nice front. Whenever the abusers around other people, they put on this nice front so people automatically come to their defense if someone, if someone accuses them of being abusive. The person who is being abused, there's beaten wife syndrome, where they think, oh, they love me, I must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. The fact remains that humans are complex creatures, and if you don't show all of the sides of humanity, then all you're doing is just making humanity worse. And that's very interesting, because when we get to talking about the villain of this particular piece, kind of the opposite is true, well, and and his his villainy is the only thing that we're, we're shown. He is kind of irredeemable in that respect. But um, going back to the historical accuracy thing, I actually uh, did some research into Frost Fairs. And people were thinking, oh yeah, that's a bit of, of made-up gibberish for the purpose of the episode. Nope, they happened. They even happened on were the they, taste. Were they really as multicultural as they were represented? Well, we don't have any any uh, records of that, but don't forget that not all historical records uh, have survived to the current day. Plus, there's the fact that some people thought of people of color as lesser human beings who probably wanted to record them. I can already I can already feel the iron glare of my uh, lecturers at, at university boring into me for saying this, but history, we don't necessarily know that what we think of as history might not be what actually happened. Yeah. Boring right through my like, like Cyclops' uh, laser sight here, but yeah, I'm sorry, it's, it's true. It's yeah. true. But in this case, based on the records that we've got access to at the moment, Sarah Dollar got it absolutely spot on, because not only were Frost Fairs a real thing, they really did happen on the Thames, and the last documented one, 1814. There so it is. Nice. the episode. So she's done her homework. Yeah. Okay, let's let's move on. It's from... always nice. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's it's always pays to do your research. Mm -hmm. Yep, always. Especially especially when you're doing a historical based show. Yes, and on this on this uh, occasion, I think you can agree on on that regard. She nailed it out of the park. Yeah, it's always great to do research, especially when you're looking into writers who usually do kids fantasy or something like that. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> oh, I went there. Don't go. One good episode does not redeem him from that. Okay, he's, he's currently 50-50. One good, one mm -hmm. terrible. More like maybe 40-70, and 70's leaning on 40, the 70? Man. We've rewritten the rules of mathematics here. Yeah, he's like 110% wrong. <laughs> I love how you rolled with that, by the way. Kudos. No, I was being serious. <laughs> oh, Okay, still kudos. So anyway, <laughs> we've we've gushed enough about Bill, I think. Uh, the Doctor. Let's talk about the Doctor. Uh, first things uh, first, I love his outfit. Yeah. His specially chosen tea clothes, as he tells not to. <laughs> <laughs> I love that at the end. The top hat. The top hat made it. Yeah, and I'm glad that, that he got the hat back after he gave it to the little orphan girl. Is is it bad that the entire time I was watching this, I was thinking he looks a lot like Scrooge from Christmas Carol? I think that was kind of the intention, <laughs> but the good Scrooge, tough. the Scrooge after he's redeemed himself, and he's going around giving uh, money and presents to people. Yeah, but yes, because he he definitely had that whole I don't quite know how to smile, but I know the general idea of it. This is how you do it, right? Yeah, kind of feel to him. 
I actually knew that this was going to be his costume uh, prior to the the episode going out a long time actually because there was a there was an image of him in the uh, in the Georgian era uh, Regency era whatever you want to call it outfit and people were saying oh is he going to be in this for most of the episodes turns out no it's just a one off I think but I wouldn't mind if they did more episodes where the Doctor changes his clothes to fit the period I know he does it sometimes but I wouldn't mind if he did it more often. Yeah, Mind I'm just you. wondering why nobody seems to question them about their clothes, except for maybe, like, once every so often in a blue moon, if it's kind of funny. Well, you've got to have a little bit of um, leeway, haven't you, for, for dramatic license. Best example of people questioning their clothing it was in the uh, the World War II episodes in, in uh, Eccleston's first series, in fact, only series. Rose is wearing a Union Jack t-shirt in the middle of the Blitz. <laughs> So things like that are, are quite good. But yeah, I, I wouldn't mind if, if they had the characters, or the time-traveling characters anyway, change their garb to more suit the uh, the situation more often. But I can also see why there's an argument for, well, he's got to have a consistent image. I, I will say, building off of this, I love that line with Bill where she's like, oh, the TARDIS has dresses and she likes getting into trouble? I think I love her. <laughs> <laughs> and the Doctor's like, yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't steer with the TARDIS, you reason with it. That's uh, that's a callback to both the pilot, when he says you negotiate with it, and uh, to bring in Freezing Inferno's um, points from his review for the first time, uh, it also calls back to a line of uh, dialogue from the Doctor's wife, where he's talking yep. to uh, Idris, who is the TARDIS, of course, and he says, you know, I, I, you never took me where I wanted to go, and she says, no, but I always took you where you needed to go. Oh, um, I better get this out of the way. Mirror alert, mirror alert. You can see the fish's eye reflected in Bill's helmet. That is all. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I was going to do that when we got to the creature itself, but we can bring it up here. Yeah, to quote him yep. verbatim, Big fish eyes reflected in Bill's diving helmet. Mirror shot, mirror shot. Quote this verbatim on the show. Yeah. I also can't do the do 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 thing correctly. We're not going to so do the do 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 thing. That. That's that's not becoming no, you a thing. Just said, you should have just said trigger warning. We're about to really talk about mirrors. I'm putting my oh, foot no. down. I'm putting my foot down. We are not doing a do 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 thing every week. Cooch, once you actually watch the other episode, you'll you'll find out why we did that. Mm. <laughs> did you just rat him out to everybody? Yes. yes. Hey, 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 hey! I'm <laughs> I'm just paid to be on this show. I'm not actually. Wait, we get paid? Shh, Sherry, Shit. we don't talk about that. <laughs> what the your, hell, man? Keep your trap shut. <laughs> and we're off the rails again. All right. Well, we're expected to be off the rails. We're fulfilling expectations. <laughs> I'm sending you a bill later. <laughs> bill And Potts? not Pearl Mackey. Damn it! <laughs> Preempted by joke. Right. Uh... Other things about the Doctor I really liked in this, uh, the gag about Pete. <laughs> the Pete gag is brilliant. It ties exactly. in with the whole, the whole, you know, butterfly effect thing that the episode's kind of got going for it. Like, if I, if I step on a butterfly, I may not even be even born. Uh, and, of course, it ties into the resolution where they change history so that uh, the orphans become the heirs to the Sutcliffe estate. But it's actually the right thing to do. But yeah, it's like, that's what Pete said. Who's Pete, exactly? He's, he he stepped to the cockroach right once. He stepped to the cockroach once, and now you don't even remember him. Butterfly. Here's, here's the other question. Did they actually look up who the Sutcliffe heir was? Or, like, did they see that the last Frost Fair ended in tragedy before they went out to it? Oh, good question. Well, they didn't know who old Sutcliffe was before they encountered him. So that's why I'm saying... They could have not changed history, and in fact, it just went as it was supposed to. Well, that's the whole thing about time travel, isn't it? Like, you don't know. There's a certain there's element no. of predestination involved. Like, funnily enough, there was an episode of Agents of Shield I watched quite recently as I was catching up with Series Three, and that's all about an, an inhuman who his touch gives people visions. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, have you finished that season yet? No, that's the last episode I saw, so please don't no watch spoilers. Um, but, um, that's yeah. actually, uh, you guys know about Civil War in the Marvel Universe, right? I do. 
they had Civil War Two, where that was the basic premise. It was, have you guys ever heard of Minority Report? Mm-hmm. I've watched it. Uh, for those who don't know, basically there's these three kids who they can see visions of people committing crimes. So in the future, the police force is tasked with finding them before they commit the crimes and then lock them up. And there's like this whole conundrum about should we be doing that because they haven't actually, you know, done the crime yet. Civil War Two is essentially that, just with a mutant. Thank you. I didn't know that, but thank you. Yeah, no, but um, I'm kind of off Marvel Comics at the moment. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Marvel TV shows, that's fine. The comics are kind of going in a bad direction. The comics are all over the fucking place. Yes. So back to uh, back to the show we should be talking about then. Uh, we've already touched on the, the scene where Spider falls through the ice and dies. And the Doctor seems to be more concerned about salvaging his uh, his magic wand. They even call it a magic wand, which I, li- I like the little call out there. But well, really, it was used more as a flashlight in this episode. Yeah, but um, as callous as that scene was, and it was intended to shock and, and uh, upset people, I think, and it certainly did and that. Bill. It yeah, it certainly did that. Uh, it does tie in with the general message of the episode, and later on, the Doctor's attitude to this is redeemed with his whole wonderful speech to Sutcliffe that we're going to get to in a moment. Uh, you could also be argued that he knew he couldn't save the boy. I think Kachiri well, I mean, already said that. It was that. kind of obvious he yeah. couldn't save the boy. Kachiri already said he's dead. Open ice. He's dead. Yeah, yeah. Like, the second his arm was sticking out, the rest of his body was inside. That kid was ceased to be. And he, uh, um, this is an ex. This is an ex shit kid. <sighs> <sighs> Sorry, I had to do it. Um, Anyways, it the sign argued, doesn't have a setting to break ice. They couldn't chip through fast enough. He would have been dead either way. It could be. I argued think his hand he, was already gray. Like I think they. Yeah, already, I think he was dead before. He, as I soon will he went say. In. In the scene where they're at the fish and they're seeing it for the first time, seeing Spider's hat being burped out oh, was God. heartbreaking. That was heartbreaking. And the, the flashback to the little guy when he was alive. Yeah. That was horrible. It also burped out other artifacts, like a shoe, I think, and a can. Maybe the drunk's bottle, the, the drunk that got uh, eaten. Just dang. Can I just can I just uh, make another point about this whole scene about with Spider? You could argue that he knew he couldn't save him, but he he would need the Sonic later on to prevent further deaths. Which, in fairness, is exactly what he did. Yeah. The only other people to die are villains. From that point on, unless the fish eats more people off screen. I don't but think it does. What we see on screen, the deaths we see on screen, is limited to four people. The drunk, Spider, Sutcliffe's minion, and Lord Sutcliffe himself. I don't think Lord Sutcliffe gets eaten. I think he just drowns in the uh, in the water under the ice. I I would like to think he gets eaten for something I'm gonna I'm gonna get into when we talk yeah, about Lord Sutcliffe. Yeah, we can hope that he gets eaten. But no no no, they found his body, so uh, oh, well, did they find his body? What... Just that he drowned. You can drown by just not being around anymore. Oh, last time I saw him, he was on the river. He must have drowned. Okay, whatever. Um, what happened? And to be fair, they didn't exactly include the signing of a sea creature, so, you know, history would be fucked. Other lines of the doctors I really enjoyed before we get to that speech, because my god, that was beautiful. Uh, what happens if I don't move on? More people die. Again, that, you know, He's seen these horrible things, but if he stops to mourn every single one of them, more horrible things are going to happen. He hasn't got time for the luxury of outrage. Which is lampshaded wonderfully later on when he absolutely does have time for outrage uh, against no, Lord Suckley. I was actually going to bring up the, uh, the season six mid-season. If you uh, must. Mm-hmm. If you must. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the guy that... Uh, Colonel Runaway, like halfway through the Colonel Runaway speech. Oh my, I'm angry. That's never happened before. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> the idea that when the Doctor gets out, out of control emotionally, anything could happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like, like that um, uh, at the end of whatever that human one was where he was uh, John Smith and he fell in love. The, the pure race that he had towards the family that was going after him. Yep. 
That was terrifying. And he doesn't even raise his voice. Oh, and just to appease Fresno, uh, appease Fresno, uh, yes, there was a mirror in that episode. Yes, someone got trapped in a mirror. <laughs> we know, Fres. You can calm down. I repeat, you have ruined the concept of reflection forever. <laughs> uh, can we talk about Peter Capaldi's worst moment in this episode briefly? Go ahead. I was being down, all down with the kids there. Did you notice? My hair was cringing. <laughs> But, but, <laughs> it does fit, because the Doctor would have been particularly streetwise. He's not cool. Theoretically, I can be a thief. Yeah. <laughs> I can steal anything in your shop. In theory, I can steal anything in theory. <laughs> As he gets thrown out, and then of course he's nicked the pies. Yeah, he got all the pies somehow. Yeah. See, I I like that just because it shows how awkward the Doctor can be. And that's like a great thing to have for this guy, is just this one little bit of humanity that we can, like, what's the word? Uh, Help me out here, what's the word? Uh, Identify with, we can identify with Identifiable, yeah, you've got it. Yeah, it's identifiable. Relatable, we relate to them. That's it. There we go. We were saying that in the last in the last uh, podcast. How the hell did I forget that? Um, Fuck if I know. <laughs> well, we nearly, got away, we, we, we nearly got away without the strong language tab, but there we go. Uh, fuck, fuckity, fuck, fuck, fuck. Well, now we really there haven't you. got away with it. Okay, let's talk about that speech. I'm going to quote the speech in full. So, uh, human progress isn't measured by industry. It's measured by the value you place on a life. An unimportant life. A life without privilege. The boy who died on the river, that boy's value is your value. That's what defines an age. That's what defines a species. So all that, I, I, all I have to respond to is this. Absolutely beautiful writing. Yeah, I think that's all we can say is it was beautiful writing, it was a beautiful speech, it was a beautiful insight into the doctor's self. So. Yeah. And again, fits with the whole message of the episode, and is the Doctor's redemption after the rather callous way he dismissed Spider. There is only one last thing to say. Kachiri, did you like the speech? Yeah. As I okay, said, then, I we're thought... done. Let's move on. Yeah. I also thought it was a strong speech. I liked the speech before that, where you talked about passion, you know, brings fighting, and you know, yes, wisdom brings uh, victories or whatever. And then it all goes to hell in a handcart. When the villain of the piece turns up, and the villain has two two forms, but one's not really a villain, we have the creature, the unnamed creature, and firstly, Lord Sutcliffe. <laughs> Suck dick. <laughs> Lord Suck dick. <laughs> That's Lord a keeper. Radcliffe. That's a keeper. <laughs> I like that, Lord Suck Dick. That's a keeper. Oh my god, I wish he had been played by Daniel Radcliffe, because then we could make that joke about the last name. God <laughs> damn it! Oh, dude, Daniel Radcliffe. If they ever have Daniel push. Radcliffe in Doctor Who, he will be, I think, in more of a substantial role than this. No, it'd be perfect for him. So anyway, uh, well, yeah, the the woman, is it the woman in white? The woman, no, woman in black. The woman in black, the woman in white, something else. He's done historical pieces before, of course, and David Copperfield, but he was, like, ten. But anyway, yeah, Lord Sutcliffe. A very one-dimensional villain. I think we'll all agree. But what I think that needed to be one-dimensional. Yeah, he he was presented to us as one-dimensional, so maybe he had that nice persona that he put on around other people. No, he was only in it for, like, the last ten minutes of the episode. He don't, I mean. he don't need to be in it in the last ten minutes, though. Yeah, I mean, he he didn't have to, you know, be, like, a great villain. He just had to be there to let, you know, the Doctor know who he was going against. He was the perfect foil. He was the perfect foil for this story, because the, the story's all about, you know, humanity and the value of, of morals and uh, individuality, I, I suppose, to a degree, and, and the value of life. And Sutcliffe just thinks about money and greed. I will say one thing. Even though he is one-dimensional, he is completely believable. Oh, yeah. Because there are people like him. He was perfectly cast. The actor that played him did a damn fine job. Yeah. People like him him are the reason that we have sweatshops. 
They're the reason that we have suicide nets on the factories for Apple. They exist. This guy is a real person that could be. Yep, absolutely. And possibly did even exist in the Victorian era. Yeah. I can't get past the mole on his forehead. But he is... a big-ass mole. Molly, 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 molly. I'm going to chop it up and make some guacamole out of it. <laughs> okay, so um, Nicholas Burns is the name of the actor that, that played Lord Suckler. He is best known for comedic roles, <laughs> but he absolutely nailed this. As I, as I say, he to has be absolutely. Fair, he kind of was in a comedic role. He was the comedic comedy, you know. He was the pompous fop, terrible one-dimension villain. He was the pompous villainous fop. And it worked here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And he's reprehensible in his actions, which, uh, and he doesn't really mind who dies as long as it, it works to his uh, benefit. So I'm a little surprised he warned his men to get off the ice. It's well, a- I mean, he needs labor at some point. And it's a lot harder to find new people than Oh, though, I could absolutely, I could absolutely see him, like, change a plan, kicking them back onto the ice to get eaten. I don't think he would have. Uh, maybe. It's not a, it's not a matter of caring. It's more the fact that if they somehow survive, they could come after him. And also doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Exactly. I'm not going to touch the poo. <laughs> he, nice. He's got labor that he already has, and they're loyal to him. I mean, they're going along with this crazy ass plot to blow up the frickin' ice with people on it to feed a fish that poops out money. Yeah. And, you know, why would he want to get rid of them? Yeah, fair enough. And um, I loved his reaction to the Doctor's wonderful speech. Oh my god, yes. I saw it coming, but it was so funny. I did see it coming, but it was still brilliant. It was so And awesome. at that moment, his card was marked that he was going to die. Oh yeah, the Doctor's yeah. face is just like, okay, what, you're what's dead. A, <laughs> what a beautiful speech, the the vocabulary and the, and the rhythm. It's enough to move anyone with an ounce of compassion. So it's really not your day, is it? The way his voice turned on that line. Brilliant. Uh, and the words were perfect, too. They weren't like the usual cliche, you know, him being all somber, and then like, but it's too bad I have no compassion, yeah. or something like that. Let's just say it moved me to a new house. <laughs> Let's say it's moved me underneath this fucking ice lake. <laughs> It moved me to send you to the ice to blow up along with everybody else. Okay, bye. Uh, I love also um, talking about him being a mostly comedic actor. The look of rage on his face, again, this was something that Freezing Inferno pointed out in his review, but the look of rage on Lord Sutcliffe's face when he goes into the tent and he realizes that the doctor's not there anymore and his plot's been foiled was absolutely priceless. Well, not foiled yet. He thought he still had a chance to run back and, you know, try to do something. No, but then he, all of a sudden, he realized, like, oh, shit, this thing's free now. And he knew that he'd lost the dynamite, or the poop bricks, because they were no longer there. The doctor was no longer there, so his captive had gotten free somehow. Well, he could still run and, you know, like, like make an alibi or something to help fix the situation. Yeah. And then, poetically... Suckless fate is to fall into the ice and drown. Yep. Now, on first watch, I was disappointed about this death. I thought, oh, you've given him such a, a mundane, lame death. Second watch made perfect sense to me. Think back to the Doctor's speech about the boy that drowned on the, on the river. You know, his life is your life. His value is your value, sorry. His death is your death. Yeah, exactly. He matches him in death. The drunk on the ice, the um, the little boy, the feast spider, their death is the same as Sutcliffe's. Sutcliffe is no better than them. And in the end, his money and his status couldn't save him. It's the one thing you could, that money cannot save you from is death. Yep. It's the great equalizer. Well, except this, nowadays they're starting to put more into longevity and shit. This, and this, will, longer, well, this so. is a bit morbid, so I apologize in advance, but the, it's the great equalizer. Death is the great equalizer. It's the one thing we will all face in the end. Yep. Didn't they say that in the Smile episode? Uh, I can't remember. 
Honestly. I have no idea. One last thing about Sutcliffe before we move on to the creature. Uh, the way his hat flew into the air <laughs> when he fell through the ice, that made me laugh a lot more than it should have done. It's just the perfect punctuation to that death scene. He he was like Wildy Coyote whenever he fails to get the Roadrunner, except this time it was a little more tragic. Well, no, because he, he deserved it. Well, no, I mean tragic because people actually died because of this guy. Oh, yes, yes, fair enough. But yeah, I, I love that well, shot the of the hat. Is still around, I'm, I'm sure. I love that simple shot of the hat falling, flying into the air. That was great. Ah! And just like Spider, all that was left was his hat. Exactly. So if he was eaten, that's how they know that he drowned. Because his hat was left floating. <laughs> there you go, we solved it. <laughs> we solved the it! the perfect mirror of Spider. Cat, no. <laughs> I was hoping we'd get off the mirror talk with Fresno not that's on the show you, this week. Frez. That's for you, Fresh. You're welcome. And I'm sure he appreciated it, because I sure as shit didn't. <laughs> Someone right. has to do it. I'm surprised on. he didn't see it before himself. Let's move on. Before. Let's move on to the creature then, which uh, didn't get a name. As far as CGI monsters go, I really like this thing. I like the fact we couldn't see much of it. Yeah, you never see any of it. Or you never see all of it at once. We got kind of like a glimpse, like it's somewhat anglerfish, kind of, sort of. I would Especially prefer glimpses. Especially it's little lurefish. I would prefer glimpses to actually, you know, revealing it all at once. Yeah. Because it, it allows your imagination to build up a picture, and also you don't get disappointed when the whole thing is revealed and it looks absolutely terrible. Plus, now, like, if you is, look the at... The creature wasn't even the main... Like, it was the focus, but for some reason I don't feel like it was meant to be the main focus of the episode. Well, I'll tell you exactly really. what this creature was, okay? It was the star whale. It was the red herring. <laughs> that was oh good. shit! It was a Star Wars, was it? Oh god! This, this, this is yep. totally this is oh, totally the Beast Below revisited with only yeah. setting. The only the difference times. between it and the Star Whale is that it actually ate the people in this one. It ate the kids. No, yeah. it, ate, it, ate, it ate the people. It ate the people in 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 the Beast Below, but it refused to eat the children. This one didn't care. Oh, it just wow. whatever. Wow. You fall in dinner. Wow. Did you not realize, Kachiri, that this was basically the Beast Below Revisited? I kind of was like, oh, shit, it's the same thing they talk about, the Beast Below, but then I just realized that, yeah, no, this is just exactly the Beast Below Revisited. Yeah, it kind of is. I just realized something. I realized I screwed up big time in our Smile uh, podcast, Cat. Uh-oh. I said that uh, Amy did not have a reaction where she, like, cried about the fate of the Earth. She totally did. Oh, did she? Yeah. She's even shown a montage of what happened to the Earth. And she starts oh. crying, and I forgot all about that. So, uh, yeah. my bad. Yeah. You can put your, your um, torches and pitchforks down now. I've acknowledged my mistake. You know, I just literally did this uh, last night. I'm replaying through uh, Wind Waker HD. And I remember whenever I played the game, whenever I was like 15, I hated the uh, Forgotten Forest dungeon. I was like, oh, man, this dungeon's so boring. I just realized they tried to read the De uh, Deku Tree dungeon from Orphan of Time, but with wind puzzles, and it sucks. So yeah. I was like... Hm. Well, to be fair, the Deku Tree kind of sucks, too. Not as bad as the Water Temple, but it still kind of sucks. Oh, uh, it's a lot better than the Forgotten Forest Temple, though. Yeah. Another thing I liked about the, the creature with a little sort of parasite anglerfish that accompanied it. I thought they were a nice design. That you did see all of them. Pies. You did, yeah. <laughs> I I bought that pie. I ate that pie. I like that pie. And I, I will say, the way the monster sort of looked kind of reminded me of like those really old maps where they didn't quite know where everything was, where all the borders were, and sometimes in the sea they drew like little pictures of dragons or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. They they probably saw the creature. They probably yeah, it's, saw that creature. Yeah. That could possibly be what, be what it is, like how some people thought there were such things as mermaids or sirens. Maybe in the Doctor Who universe there really are, and they're just like genetic mutations or whatever. 
one uh, one slight plot hole about the that creature. I, I love the scene where they're in the diving suits and uh, trying to get eaten. And she throws the lantern at the doctor because he can't hear her talking. But those old time diving suits, not sure they would have protected you against that freezing cold water. No, they wouldn't have. I can let it slide because it was a good little scene. And honestly, th- there's been far worse breaches of, of uh, plot logic. Here's, here's the thing I didn't understand, and I don't know if I just missed something. How in the world did the doctor get the diving suit after they escaped from the tent? And That's he went a better question. Bombs? That's I a better question. I I want to I want to interject that there's probably if if anything he probably just went back there at a later time and left a diving suit behind some of the barrels. So when he finally escaped, he saw the diving suit. And that's know. getting that's getting into it. that's getting into circular loops that I really don't want to get into. But yeah. I mean, he could have just abandoned them there, but then that would have the whole, you know, what if someone He could have also it, just escaped out of there, and he probably could have ran to where he, they left the suits, which, I mean, you know, there was like a good five minutes of scenes of, you know, everyone evacuating the river. He could have just ran straight to where he left the suits and grabbed his and ran back. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the very important thing to, to note here is that the creature is not the monster here. It's it's Sutcliffe. It's man. It's it's some men. Oh God, this is almost an environmental message. The orphan, yeah, absolutely. The orphans are not monsters. The innocent people on the ice are not monsters. But the men that choose to be monsters are monsters. Yeah. And it is it's not always your actions that detect if you're a monster, but it is how you react to them. Yeah. And how you see your fellow uh, your fellow human beings, I guess. Yep. Wow, we are getting super political in here, aren't we? It, it's like if oh, this was a Lord very political Sutcliffe, episode, actually. Yeah. If Lord Sutcliffe had just fed the, the fish something else, he still would have been terrible for keeping it locked up. But he wouldn't be as terrible as he is for feeding it humans. Oh yeah, no, he's he's irredeemable. I want to know if the fish just the monster just does that naturally, or if it has to be specifically humans for it to have the burnable fuel poop. Never explained. And honestly, there are some things that don't explain any kind of ways because I mean that that lake probably is just empty other than for its angular fish and its um. Um, for, yeah, he probably, the fish probably ate all the other fish in that river. This is yeah. something that Freezing Inferno talks about a lot, but he likes ambiguity. And in yeah, this I like instance, it too. I'm just one of those people who likes to nitpick and think about the logistics of stuff. No, that that's I really shouldn't. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. To each their own, but this is one instance where I'm happy to have some, some ambiguity. It doesn't ruin any, anything for me. Yeah. We don't find out what the fish is. Was it an alien? Was it terrestrial? Was it a product of a bygone era that just happened to survive or, or whatever? We don't know. We'll never know. That's absolutely fine. You'll, you know, draw your own conclusions on that. Um, it was chained up. How the hell did they get it chained up? It doesn't matter. How the heck did they find out that its poop burns underwater? And that a poop, the poop burns at all? Because the plot requires you, as the viewer, to know well, that they, they said that it's been a secret that's been going down from his family for years. So. Yeah, but somebody that. still had to figure that out. Right, so he asked... Well, who was, the first, who was the first person who looked at a chicken and was like, I'm going to eat the first thing Cat, that you can, came, you can, comes you can, out you can, uh, you can gloss it over very easily. One of Suckler's ancestors just happened one day to uh, encounter a block of the, of the fish poo, accidentally uh, struck a, a, a light near it, it burned, or, but it didn't or blow accidentally up. like tripped and it fell in the fire and it burned for like forever. Yeah, something like that. You can quite they easily were, they swear were, that um, away. I don't know if this is a thing in England, but they were looking for oysters or clams or something. They took a lot of the mud with them. It fell in the fire, or maybe they were trying to put out the fire. It they put it on there's, the fire. There's and a dozen different ways you could you could square it away. Is, is the point I'm making? Either way, it's just random bullshit. Where it wasn't explained, it's fine that it wasn't explained. Yeah, and I like the fact that it was kind of in the. It wasn't a major focus of the episode, the creature, or tiny, as the doctor eventually called it. Classic British humour, calling it what it isn't. 
classic humor that everybody has. It's not just British people. I'm sorry to tell you. You don't believe in that, but I know the truth. All right then. One last America. Time. Fuck yeah. Coming again to save the motherfucking day. Yeah. Welcome to the Patriotism Podcast. <laughs> yeah, you're you're kind of outnumbered this time. We have fish and chips. End of argument. We also have fish and chips. We yes, pilfered from us, you filthy brigands. Well, you know what we have that you guys don't? Hush puppies. Mm. No, we've got that. No, it's don't. an import, but we've got that. Anyway. Oh, hey, 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 it's what? Import. What was that? It's imported. What? Was that? what? Yes, and you oh, import no. the fish and chips, so don't go slinging mud when you can't sling mud. No, we grow our own potatoes, bitches. Actually, we better stop Kachiri because he might name the one thing that will completely destroy us. Eggplant? It, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking I, about. I, you know what? I'll, I'm I'll choosing. Tell you after, I am choosing no, to show mercy. On. I know what she's talking about. I'm choosing to show mercy. I'm also trying to get this damn thing finished for us all. <laughs> so, um, the orphans. Not really much to talk about the orphans. They were there. Oh, let's forget about them. Everyone else does. Well, can we just mention one thing? One of the actors that played one of the orphans, Perry. Yes. His name is Bad. His name is Badger Skeleton. <laughs> Which I read as Badger Skeleton. I was like, why the hell did you name your kid that? Maybe it's a nickname, maybe it's a nickname, but who knows. The orphans, for their part, they weren't that memorable, but they weren't necessary for the plot. I like that they they weren't the kids from the Forest of the Night. They certainly weren't, they were, they were okay. Um, I liked them, I wanted them to live, I got sad when Spider was murdered. Yeah. The, the little girl, is it, is it Dot? She was kind of cute. The one that was selling uh, flyers to go into the Frost Fair. And then, she, and then she pinched his hat. They're so cute. And she also... Her, her shoes were hiding out behind the curtain when she was hiding. So cute. Yeah, that was that was kind of cool. Also, the the elephant. Uh, I've already mentioned the elephant in the room, but the actual elephant of the episode. I've just realised that was supposed to be a, a comparison with the creature there, because it's been enslaved for the benefit of its owner, and we find out its owner is the same as the creature, and that's Lil Sockler. Yep. Okay, one last scene to talk about, and then we can get into overall thoughts. No doll, no doll, and the vault. This is one of those scenes we're going to come back to when the series is over, I feel. And realize yeah, it had more significance. One of those scenes we're just going to keep on looking at for the rest of the season. I hope it doesn't show up in the next couple of episodes. Yeah. This is becoming Very Missy good. in Series 8 levels of mystery. Yeah, I'm starting to regret saying that in Smile it was downplayed, because now it's being upplayed again, it's like, no. Well, the yeah. thing is, this is one, one of the nicer things was, like, those last two episodes felt like a Unofficial two-parter. Just uh, how it, because, you know, the sort of smile started with Nardul, you know, complaining, like, you promised you wouldn't leave. Oh, just give us uh, some tea. I'll just move the TARDIS back into the office. And then this episode ends with the TARDIS in the office with Nardul again and tea. Oh, that was and, funny, by the way. Here's your tea. And I had some coffee as well to give it some flavor. <laughs> 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 Who does that? <laughs> Someone who has never had tea before, apparently. Clearly. Also, the whole bit about, I mean, about his special tea drinking clothes. We've already touched on that, but that was hilarious. I mean, let's be fair. When the 11th Doctor first appeared, he was eating, like, fish fingers and custard, so... Yeah, fair mm -hmm. enough. Fair enough. But, um... Nardole wasn't really the, the, main ish, uh, the main focus here. It was that damn vault. And whatever yeah. the hell is inside that vault. Now, we're not going to talk spoilers or speculation about what that is. If you really, want, if you really want to do that, now, Kachiri, if you want to do that, you can do that in a private message with me because Cat does not want spoilers. Yeah, I'm running an, for those who might not know, I'm running an experiment. Um, Moffat said that they had a spoiler at the end of one of their previews, so I tried to avoid that and I managed to. So I'm trying to see if I can somehow either guess what's going on or if I will be genuinely surprised by what's going on. Yes. Based on that spoiler not being seen. Yes, I I, I, un I understand entirely. By the way, did you get a next time trailer? Me? This time? Uh, yeah. You haven't for the past couple of episodes. I haven't I been able to watch. 
I haven't been able to watch BBC A the last three weeks, so. I Sorry, found Kat. out why I haven't been able to see it. Right. Immediately after Doctor Who premieres, they premiered the new episode of Class. Right. And right before it appeared, they said, uh, like, wait until the middle of Class to see a preview of the next Doctor Who episode. Ah, it's like, fuck you! Gotcha. I am now watching this show just to see a preview of the next show. Fuck you. Yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely fair. So, uh, I will say this, the scene in the vault, this is the first time I felt that Nardole was not just tacked onto the episode, it felt like he fit. I thought Matt Lucas did a decent job of the acting, and we now know, of course, that whatever is in that vault, it's alive or it's sentient because of the knocking. And it wants out. Oh, it definitely wants out. Yes, thank you, that is what knocking sounds like, Kachiri, well done. Well, how many knocking is it? Three. It comes with three. Four knots. No, no it's not, three. Uh, it's, it's three. I think it knocked four times once, but otherwise it was three. It, it may not, have knocked four times right at the end. It might have knocked not four times right at the end, but it might have also been the sting for the next time kicking in. It could uh, also have been domestic. another red herring. Absolutely. So, um, whatever's in the vault, we we think it's it's going to... Well, we know it's going to get out, don't we? I mean, it's the only lost conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, sadly, the vault is not Vegas. And so when it, it does, gonna it's going to absolutely kill Nardole. Oh, he's doomed. One can only hope. As long as I'm still Sorry. here, you're going nowhere. He's he's doomed. Sorry, Matt Lucas, but seriously, I kind of hope he does die. Just because well, he's, he's just going to get reassembled. It's all good. Mm, there are certain levels of reassembly you can't actually get to. Or disassembly that you can't actually come back Well, I mean, it's only his head that's real anymore, right? The rest of him is robotic. We think so. It's not really been stated either way, but the whole thing about him dropping bits of himself, that sounded awful. Did did he say something in this episode as well about being mostly made of metal or something? I don't know. He he, he he says about being reassembled. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So I'm intrigued about this mystery surrounding the vault, but now can we not bring it up until episode six at the very least? Yeah, can we hold off, please? Let's take a break. Let's no, focus no on the episodes. No more cutting away to, like, Missy laughing. Let's focus on the episodes and, uh, you know, take it from there. And then maybe down the line we can have another tease of the vault and actually get some information about it. That would be a good way to do it, rather than every single week. Oh, here's the vault. Oh, I'm here to guard the vault. My name is Nardole. I'm a mystery. Get over yourself, Moffat, please. Yeah... Well, at least in the next, like, the next episode, we, uh, get a little bit more into Bill's past. Yeah, well, her present rather than her past, but yes. So I think that's everything that we can really talk about, Thin Ice. I don't think we've missed anything out. Can you think of anything, Kat, Kachiri? Yeah. Nope. I don't think so. Okay, then. Let's move on to our overall thoughts and wrap this baby up. So, uh, Kachiri, what were your thoughts on Thin Ice overall? No, I think it's been well talking to throughout this whole uh, podcast. It was just a really good, solid episode. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like mind blowing, but like, you know, it was well written, well acted. It made me like a character I didn't think I was going to like so well at the start of the season. So yeah, it was a good episode. I would agree. In fact, I'll give my overall thoughts now. If you don't mind me shaking up the status quo a bit, because that is kind of you know what the episode's about. Ho ho. Uh, I thought this was a really good episode, honestly. It took potentially sensitive political issues, which are extremely relevant in the modern era, and it handled sadly. them, I thought, sadly indeed, uh, I thought it handled them really well, really rather well. I thought Bill's character development uh, continued in a really positive direction, and the resolution to the episode was satisfying and logical in equal measure, and the villain getting his much-needed comeuppance and death was icing on a very sweet cake. And I think Sarah Dollard has... Uh, knocked it out of the park a second time, and I hope she continues to write for the show in the future. Kat, your thoughts? Um, I'm going to have to agree with everything else. Sarah Dollar is an extremely good writer. Uh, she really knows how to write her character. She knows how to write her plot. She even knows how to, you know, write in a like kind of irrelevant creature into the story and make me want to, you know, actually learn more about this creature. So, really, I think this was another episode that just hit it out of the park. A little bit more than Smile did, just because the Smile's ending didn't quite interest me, but this one definitely hit it out of the park, and I really feel like we're forgetting something for some reason. No, we've covered everything. 
So, yeah, right. next week then, next time, we have Knock Knock. Well, no, no, I, I really feel like we're forgetting something. Are we? Uh, I mean, we've talked about Bill, the Doctor, the Bad Guy, the Punch, the... The Punch! The, the, what, what? We forgot about the Punch. The Doctor punched a racist! How in the world did we forget about that? I don't know, because that was the best thing ever. Did we all step into a cr- for a crack in time for a moment? What the hell was that all about? I was, like, cheering in the bedroom as I was watching this, like, oh my god, he punched her in That the punch was amazing. Sadly, oh, sadly, it had already been shown in a trailer before the episode aired, so I knew it was coming, but I still love the context for it, and it's just like, um, the whole thing about, you know, we need to, we need to be tactful and, and, uh, di- diplomatic, and then, Screw that! Punch. He did. He didn't even think. He just immediately saw this dude being an asshole. To you do not insult like, oh, my companion. Up. Smash. <laughs> One punch man to the face. Brilliant. Brilliant. Unfortunately, unfortunately, not everybody on the internet thought the way we did about it. What a surprise! Yeah. Um. There were some rather hilarious Twitter messages, Twitter posts, uh, this weekend who said that they were done with the show because it was pandering to the SJWs. Because he punched a racist. Uh, I think it was more possibly the thing about Jesus being black, but um, I have Um, just one thing to say. He was in the Middle East. I have just one thing to say to these so-called fans of this series. Have you been living under a fucking rock? I think that's too generous. It's more like, have you been living at the bottom of the fucking seafloor underneath a rock that is covered in concrete? Quite. Because seriously, This people, show is built on sociopolitical issues. Yeah. The Daleks are space Nazis for crying out loud. Well, they pretty much are space Nazis. I don't think they are specifically space Nazis, but you know what I mean, don't you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even if it was SJW pandering, this is where we lose like 50% of the viewers, right? If it was pandering to SJWs, which it wasn't, by the way, what in the hell is wrong with the Doctor, the hero of this show, punching a racist in his goddamn face? Nothing. What's wrong or with that? his friend. What was wrong with that? I am... I am sick to death, I'm sorry to go on a tangent here, but I am sick to death of people dismissing things as quote-unquote SJW garbage because it happens to touch on political issues. It doesn't e- It doesn't even mean like people who are actually social judge- justice warriors. It's just a general term for ideas or people you don't like anymore. It has become that, I would say. Sometimes- it's essentially what... Other words have become. Other words that are now offensive have become. A catch-all like, umbrella term for people you don't like. I mean, there are people that use yeah. it in the, in the quote-unquote correct definition, but um, mm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That punch was nothing to do with SJWs. It was just a beautiful moment that the script absolutely called for. And yeah, one of the best moments of Series 10. Possibly one of the best moments of Capaldi's entire tenure. Plus, according to a post someone wrote on Tumblr, and yes, I'm going to talk about this, According to the rules of social etiquette in Victorian times, he was being an asshole in general by commenting on Bill. Yeah. So not only was he a racist, he was also an asshole. Absolutely. Absolutely. Plus, let's not forget the fact he killed who knows how many people. His family killed who knows how many people. He's keeping a fish monster locked up just to make money off of it, and he's essentially profiting off the despair and dismay of the poor. Absolutely. So, I think we can all agree, fun. I think we can all agree here that it was the best punch shown on TV this weekend. I'm yes. sorry, Anthony Joshua, I know you're the World Heavyweight Champion, I know your uppercut of Vladimir Klitschko was effing awesome, but it doesn't compare to Peter Capaldi punching a racist in his teeth. It wasn't his teeth, it was his chin. All right, still chin. See the shiner. It doesn't compare you to still see the shiner chin. after the scene. Wherever he hit him, it doesn't compare. Is the point. And now I, got... I want to like make that my banner for everything. Just Peter Capaldi punching racist. 
I, I want to plaster that on a giant billboard opposite a certain house that might be white that's in our country. Just like for a, no particular reason. Just like a video board, that's just like playing it on a loop for 24 hours. And Sutcliffe might be orange, but again, for no reason. <laughs> okay, but for real this time, next week we have Knock Knock. Now, Kat, you've not seen the, the next time trailer for this. Kachiri, you did, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll give the synopsis like I've been doing for the past two episodes. Uh, Bill is moving in with some friends, and they found the perfect house. So what if it's strangely cheap to rent and the landlord is a little creepy? The wind the blows. Eat you alive. The wind blows. The floorboards creak. The doctor thinks something is very wrong. What lurks in the strange tower at the heart of the building? And why can't they find any way to enter it? So what this basically is, is our spooky episode of the series. It's the haunted house episode. And it looks amazing. And I'm probably setting oh, myself up for a the, the In the trailer, the, the guy, the landlord, he looks so familiar. He's Poirot. Who's that? David Suchet, Hercule Poirot, himself. And what? a man, a man I have been absolutely wanting for years and years to be in Doctor Who is finally in Doctor Who. He's playing a creepy landlord. My Christmas just came early. You signed the contract. It's time to pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. He's a, he's a brilliant actor. He's such a brilliant actor. I'm so happy he appears to be playing a villain. Or maybe he won't be playing a villain. Maybe it'll be less cut and dry than that. We don't know. Yeah, we already had one cookie cutter cut out of a villain. Let's not have another one, like, right in a row. David Suchet is too good to be a cookie cutter. If they've written him properly, it'll be great. If they've not written him properly, I'll be raging about this for 45 minutes at the next podcast. All right. <laughs> so when so the next we'll podcast... have two different podcasts. We'll have the one where you rant and the one where the rest <laughs> of us talk. So if you uh, if you tune into the podcast next week and you see it, it goes three hours long, you'll know what happened. <laughs> you'll know what happened. Or or but, um, uh, or Rainier just decides not to edit out all the outtakes, and I'm in the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the next episode, just bring a bottle of your favorite alcohol and play the Doctor Who drinking game. That'll make it go by so fast. Don't do that; it'll kill you. <laughs> we only killed one person last time. Statistically, we're fine. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Where's Fros now? I did one person. Can That's we stop it. this idea? Can I stop? Can we stop with this idea that I killed Fresno? I didn't kill Fresno. <laughs> sure. He's alive and on a farm somewhere. He's fine. <laughs> on a farm. Oh, so he's on a farm upstate. Is he fertilizer? Did you fertilize him? Did you hand him to the pigs? So I'd, like to thank all. so I'd like to thank you all for listening to Doctor Who Reviews for this week. I'd like to thank my guest, Kat Gachiri. I think he just hit him. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh. I can't. I can't. I, I can neither confirm nor deny that I have moved into a farm at state. There you go. That's, that's, that's that my story. That was run by David it. Cameron and his pigs. Cat, oh, no. God. And it's covered in mirrors. If you're driving past it and you get that net, like that annoying thing where the sun hits something and it like, blinds you, yeah, you're going past the farm. So uh, that was the Doctor Who reviews. I'd like to thank my guest, Maniac <laughs> <and> Kachiri. <laughs> Kachiri! <laughs> thank you for listening. To Doctor Who reviews. I'd like to thank Kachiri. Ignore Kachiri. the fact that this is on Rainiac's channel. This is I'd really like to thank room. Kachiri for being my guest. I'd like to not thank Kat for hijacking the podcast. <laughs> it's mine now, bitch. Where's my money? You're not getting paid. <laughs> Why if, is Kachiri getting paid? If I'm not getting paid, if Kachiri's not getting paid, you're not getting paid. That's how democracy works, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> That's equal pay. You've been crying out for <laughs> Lastly, to the people that are still listening to this, thank you so much. And if you actually want to uh, put yourself through this next week, we'll see you next time when we review Knock Knock. Until then, I've been ready. there. Until then, I've been ready. <laughs> <laughs>
that's really how we want to start, is it? Okay. <laughs> so, so wait, are those tits on a nipple? No, 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 no. We're going the inception route. Those tits are inside the nipple that are inside breasts. Ah. Oh, so you're an any man. I get you. <laughs> Ingrown tits. <laughs> you gotta punch them for the woman to feel anything for them. Just, <laughs> just get a workout in there. Just get a couple punchy bag routines going on. <laughs> you get women with like size D breasts and they're coming at her back. <laughs> uh, better Be- not get them off any ideas. Be right back, dying a little inside. <laughs> <laughs> a little? We're not doing that job. Okay, okay, dying a lot inside. <laughs> <laughs> So, I think we've covered absolutely everything, have we not? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, let's let's briefly give our overall thoughts, and then we'll go into the into next week's Oh, hey, episode. wait, I was thinking about, with all that knocking, why about, uh, that's like punching a door, right? Punch, we skipped. Okay, firstly, you've you've done it too soon. Yeah, you <laughs> Secondly, did it Secondly, the soon. audio skipped as you said it, so it's fine. Plus, that was kind of a lame way to do it. Yeah. Damn it, you're lame! Yes, yes I am, but also that was a lame way to do it. I know you are, but what am I? Raniac. <laughs> Cat, you're as cold as ice! Nah. Is that it? Nah. Is that no- it? Nothing like okay, that. Okay then. <laughs> nothing like that. that. <laughs> it's not it, Kachiri. Stop asking me if that's it. <laughs> You have to Is tell it me it? if that's it. Yeah, that it. It's not it. I can tell the world say <laughs> it's not it. <laughs> it's always going to the blooper reel. <laughs> no. No, Might as well. This the blooper point. reel will be longer than the actual podcast. <laughs> Is there a problem with that? <laughs> yeah, it always happens with Kachiri's here. <laughs> we just lose all track. Yes. Also, also, you just the, the, you nearly kill the host with the robot's want to go. Just, just cut all this out. Put it in its own separate blooper video because there's I am, some. I am now known as Golden Chaos Kuchiri. Oh jeez. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Peter Capaldi punched a dude. <laughs> Cat! Damn it! <laughs> Damn it! Okay. I can't resist! I'm, I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna continue and you've got yourself pulled together. <laughs> right. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. It's Go okay, ahead. it's okay. I will forgive it. I will forgive it this one time. Right. Uh, all this has to be in outtakes, by the way. It is. Three, two, one and so that's I think every oh damn it <laughs> so I think that's we're never gonna get through all this <laughs> no we're not <sighs> did you just, just snort like yes. a pig yes yes it happens when I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you better not let David Well, I'm, do I'm, that. Not holding, I'm not holding that over you for the rest of the series. Not at all. <laughs> this is not going to be the Monty Python blackmail sketch. No, sir. <laughs> no, hang on. To, hang on, hang on, hang on. Me, you listened to me when I said you should have added friends to your... Hey, hang on, hang on. Rainiac, I've got a great knock-knock joke, but you have to start it off, okay? So go ahead. Next time, knock knock. God damn it! (laughs) (laughs) Until next time, I've been ready. I can go back to admit myself to the funny farm, and I'll see you next time. I didn't even have to say a thing. Did you know the word gold was written on the ceiling, Raniac? Really? Where? (laughs) You need to have like three outtake videos. You gotta come to.
like starting to pot ass on face, middle of the pot on face, and trying to end the show out. <laughs> Until next time, I can't say it. Uh, we still oh haven't. God, technically, we still haven't finished. Technically, we still haven't I finished. Said, oh, you said goodbye. You did finish. What the fuck?